good morning. morning. One more time. Good morning. morning. So we, we took a few chairs down during the week. It's good that we did because now everybody comes, we get to set up more chairs. It is great to have all of you here. It is great to have all of you here. And the music that you heard, it was great to have Sarah Hanksler here. About once a year, sometimes twice a year, we discover that every instrumental musician that helps us with the praise band is gone. And that's this day. So Sarah, because Jacob is also gone from the other end. So Sarah comes in, plays early church, comes down, plays middle church, goes back and plays late church. You're just like one of the pastors today. That's right. That's right. So the other thing that changes a little bit is that the hymns aren't our traditional contemporary ones, but they're two of the three are pretty singable. Okay. (laughs) And the other one, I'll tell you that it's not so singable, but the words fit. All right. We are awfully glad that you're here today. We welcome you. And those of you online, we welcome as well. Pastor Chip is away for the day. So we, he'll be back in the office tomorrow. So Sarah Higginbotham, we've officially welcomed her. She is just gifted beyond belief. And her husband at both other services serves as the reader, but Manda today serves as our reader. So thank you for that. Uh, God's work our hands. We've been talking about that it's September 12th, but today's the last day to sign up to get a new shirt. They're freebies, folks. So if you need it, one of those yellow shirts do. If not, if you've got one, just use that one. If you've got one that you've outgrown or it's outgrown you, whatever, you can bring those and we'll help share with others. But that's today. The giving tree. We're going to blink and it's going to be time for school again. I hate to say that out loud, but it will be true. So we have, we're part of the back to school bash. We we're collecting supplies. So the giving tree out there, give that a look, take one or two tags. And in addition, we're collecting dry erase markers and clean underwear, just certain sizes this year, because last year, uh, the back to school bash either was limited in numbers, but we've already got a lot of other sizes. Thursday nights, Thursday nights, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12th graders, Thursday nights, the back hill. If you drive by the back hill today, you'll see the remnant of a super slip and slide, I guess, 100 feet long, 100 feet long. I found two of the people that played in it. They were stuck in a bush later, two days later, Jacob, we found them. But again, this Thursday night, six to eight, everybody, eight through nine, eight o'clock to nine o'clock, the, uh, the older high school kids will stay. Anyway, the laundry project, thank you. We've got enough volunteers to actually help on the 22nd, but there'll be another date down the road and you can continue to make donations if that's something that's important. Lutheran Outdoor Ministries, that means the Indiana Kentucky Synod has three outdoor ministry camps. There's brochures on the information desk. There's a few brochures on the table out here. There's still time to go to camp, I think, if you want. But really, I wanted you just to see the information, and it gives you a website where to go and check all of that out. Pickleball. Many of you play pickleball. Many of you might want to learn about pickleball. Saturday, August 14th. Now, that, not, that detail's not in the Yellow Connect. But it will be. But it's Saturday, August 14th, 8 o'clock to 9.30. 16 is the max for this free lesson. There's eight signed up already, so it's on the information desk. They provide the paddles. They provide the balls. They'll teach you to have fun or at least show you. So if you've ever wondered about it, it would be a great opportunity to do it with church members. That's for sure. And then our ongoing Bible studies, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you can check those out as well. We rejoice that God brings us together on this Sunday, July 11th. We're pleased as many, many, many folks are back and we rejoice for that. We rejoice for those of you watching online. We come as friends, we come as sisters and brothers in the faith, but you know what I'm gonna say, we also come as people of God who stumble and fall short. So the order for confession and forgiveness, it'll be on your screen and this screen, we stand and worship the living God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Trusting God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal God, our creator, in you we live and move and have our being. 
Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we were still sinners. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. Amen. And before Sarah begins this, I did miss one announcement that was just handed to me on the way in. Uh, Zoe Brock, in particular with other high school girls, trying to begin a group to meet called the Sisterhood of First English. They do meet again tomorrow night. Last minute notice, any high school young lady from First English or a friend is welcome. They're gonna meet at Roscoe's down in the Depot District, down in the Depot District, 7.30 to nine o'clock tomorrow night. If you're interested, you're not committing for life, just to check it out. So 7.30 to nine o'clock tomorrow night, high school girls of First English or any friends they might invite. We continue with the song, This Is My Father's World. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. O oh Lord, I cry to you for help. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Give me the joy of your saving help again. And sustain me with your spirit. Let my mouth be full of your praise. And your glory all day long. Every day will I bless you. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness. O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth, and of the seeds that are far away. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. He redeems my life from the grave. And crowns me with mercy and loving kindness. Lord, hear my prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Please join me in the words we pray the prayer together. O oh God, from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. 
Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. This is kind of the word we share intentionally with youngsters, but we are all children of God, so I invite us all to listen in. There are certain words or phrases that we use maybe more than any other every single week. Every single week. You know, I love you might be one, okay? I love you. Three words, simple words, I love you. Two words, thank you, thank you. Maybe the first words you ever learn, boys and girls, but we say it all the time, and so do adults. And then that last word, please. So I love you and thank you and please, but I want to add one today. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So whether you're a youngster, a little boy and girl, whether you're watching online or you're here, I'm sorry, I think is said an awful lot or should be said an awful lot. You say you're sorry when you've done something you shouldn't. You say you're sorry when you promised you'd do something and you don't do it. You say you're sorry when you're mean to your brother and sister, or maybe more likely, they're mean to you, okay? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Boys and girls and children of God, do you realize that every single Sunday, that's what we say to God? Fancy your words, we call it a confession, we just did it, but what we're really saying and need to say, not just Sunday mornings, Almost every morning, maybe every night, to God is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't believe enough. I'm sorry that I didn't trust you. I'm sorry I took your name in vain. I'm sorry I lied. I'm sorry I cheated. I'm sorry. Every single Sunday morning, that's how we start church. By saying to God, I'm sorry. Call it a confession. Here's the good news. Every single Sunday morning, God comes back and says what? You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Can you think of anything better? If you've ever had a fight with your wife or husband, if you've ever had a fight with your best friend, if you've ever had a fight, one family against another whole family, if you've ever had a fight at a workplace, if you've ever had a fight, there's probably no better feeling, if we're honest, than after both come to grips and each one might say they're sorry, there's forgiveness. There's forgiveness. There's usually a hug. There's usually peace and your heart is at ease. So, it really has nothing to do that the lessons we're gonna preach on. It just dawned on me this week that sometimes, maybe a lot of times we come and we might be thinking, I need to say I'm sorry to someone. Or we might be thinking, I hope someone says I'm sorry to me. I'm sorry is the only thing, if we're honest, that holds families together, it really is. It's the only thing that holds churches together. It's the only thing that holds nations together. To say and to be willing to be heard, I'm sorry. We do it every Sunday morning. And then here's the greatest news ever. It really is. God forgives us. God forgives us. God forgives us. Because if you think about it, we surely blow it sometimes. Okay, we really do. We goof it up with our families. But we blow it probably more times with God. And if God is willing to forgive us, then we ought to be willing to forgive each other. Maybe today, maybe this week, it's just a word that says to you, go to someone, if you should, and say, I'm sorry. Let's pray. Hello, God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. We're sorry that we sin against you. And we are happy you forgive us. We love you, God. Amen. Amen. We continue with our readings. From Amos 7, 7 through 15. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, 
See, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophecy for my people Israel. The word of the Lord. From Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the rich riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things, according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Mark's Gospel, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. Others said, it is Elijah, and others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his quarters and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved. Yet out of regard for his oath and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. 
Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and mercy and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Now, having said that, I think maybe this morning, maybe not so much grace and mercy and peace. Verses 27 and 28, in case somehow you missed that. So immediately Herod sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison and brought back the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And when we finish, we say, the gospel of the Lord? I mean, honestly, whose idea was that? The lectionary, as you're coming to know, a three-year cycle of readings. Over a period of three years, a great many mainline traditions and denominations use the same lectionary. So they'll take a year and read through the Gospel of Mark. They'll take a year and read through the Gospel of Matthew. They'll take a year and read through the Gospel of Luke. And the Gospel of John, they just tuck that in here and there each and every year. What's the point? To have Scripture in the midst of worship. To have Scripture in the midst of our gathering. Now, we don't always read the same stories from those Gospels. Sometimes Jesus does this, sometimes Jesus says that. But week after week, we have a story about Jesus, who is the Christ lifted up. Now, there was a group of people who put together that lectionary. If I knew who they were, I would like to say, when the suggestion came for today's reading to be the head of John the Baptist on a platter, Whose idea was that? I mean, who thought that was a good idea? What were they thinking? And then we say the gospel of the Lord. I mean, half of you, you've either just finished breakfast or you're going to go have breakfast. At late church, they're on their way to lunch. I mean, whose idea was that? Here's a wonderful picture. What should we talk about? I don't want to say it again because there's youngsters in the house. The head of John the Baptist on a platter. So I really miss... Pastor Chip being here this week. Because see, if he was, he'd be preaching. He'd be preaching. And as I wrote that down, I thought, huh, maybe he looked ahead and decided he better be away. Now the truth is, in congregational life, congregational leadership, in church circles, there's really nothing absolutely brand new that ever happens. We use different names, we use different titles, but over the years, really over the centuries, church life as people struggle to make the name of Christ known is pretty much similar. Only new names are given, new names are given. So a few years ago, the new movement was called the church growth movement. The new emerging church movement. I'm not making fun because what they're trying to do is reach out even beyond us. They're trying to say to people who maybe have drifted away from church, to people who went to church as a kid and their only memory of it is boring, okay? They're trying to say, come back. So they looked for new approaches. They looked for suggestions that will help people to come. A few years ago, one of those suggestions was remove crosses from the front of your worship space. Take the crosses out. Why would they say that? Because front and center, we just don't need people thinking that the faith is all about suffering and dying. So why don't you try to take the crosses out of your worship space? We haven't quite pulled that off, nor will we, nor will we. But I'm here to tell you that a few churches that did that, they're not preaching on the head of John the Baptist today. They are not doing that. Now, I set that up to say this. What kind of story is this? It's a real one. It's a real faith story. And it's a real Bible story. 
That's not going to be included in a children's Bible story collection, and it should never be a part of children's bedtime stories, okay? But it is a real story. So today as we hear it, experience it, listen to it, grab a hold of it, it's hard to imagine that you can just put that down, the gospel of the Lord, and say, oh, good, good. No, it's not so good. It's a story about what can happen when the goodness of God and the goodness of faith in God and the goodness of the people of God encounters the sinfulness of people. When the goodness of God encounters the sinfulness of people. It's a story about the ways of the Christ not really being the ways of the world. It's a story about what price a person might pay. It's a story about what faith might truly cost you in your life. In our case, John the Baptist, it's a real story about a real believer and what the reality of that faithfulness meant for him and cost him. Mark doesn't write it down just so if we're talking at night, I wonder what ever happened to that John the Baptist guy, okay? You know, the crazy guy, wore camel's hair, ate locusts and honey. I wonder what ever happened to him. Well, you know, Mark told us, no, it's more than just history. It's a story that Mark writes down to make sure, just like he wants us to make sure that we believe in Christ, that faith will cost you something. That faith matters. That faith is actually lived out in a real world, sometimes with real resistance. So it's like this. If Jesus owns your heart, if Jesus kind of guides your life in between Sunday mornings here, If Jesus watches over you, even if you're watching at home, if Jesus is your life, demanding things can happen. Difficult things can happen. Testing things can happen. When we're part of a community of faith, and these are our faith stories, and they are, when our lives point to Christ, we might be put on the spot. When our lives reflect Christ, we might have to say certain things that the world really won't want to hear. We might have to do certain things that the world will not want us to do. They won't be well received. Life can be filled with trouble because the ways of the Christ are not the ways of the world. If we're honest, sometimes the Bible tells us more than we want to know. It really does. Sometimes we'll read a text and say, rather not, rather not. The Bible will tell us more than we really need to know. One of my favorite guys in the world at First English Lutheran Church, called to heaven by now. Every time he go to the doctor and I go in, I say, what's going on? I don't want to know. I tell the doctors, I don't want to know a thing. Just do what you do. And he wouldn't let him talk to him at all. He didn't want to know. Mark, the gospel writer, wants you to know to know about Jesus. Most of all, to believe in Jesus, to trust Jesus, to give Jesus your life. But then he says this as well. If faith is real, it may cost you. It does have a price. If people could tell that you honestly love Jesus the rest of the week, that you honestly reflect Jesus, and I don't mean standing down in the corner holding up a sign, but just who you are reflects the love of Jesus with your words. It's honest. Sometimes people look down on you. Sometimes behind your back, they'll poke fun of you. Oh, you're one of those goody-goodies. You're those self-righteous people that think you're better than everybody else. I doubt, living where we do, that it will ever be as drastic as John the Baptist. But it will cost us something. Because there is resistance to the faith. The Old Testament reading from Amos, already resistance to God's people, resistance to God's teaching. Amos wasn't a prophet. He was a herdsman, a dresser of sycamore trees. He was just a regular person. But God calls him to go to that nation and proclaim you're not living as you should. He goes into their temple and stands up and says, this is going to happen. You're going to be driven out of the land, Judah. You're going to pay a price. And the prophets of that temple go to their king and say, get him out of here. Get him out of here. The land cannot bear his words. Because his words were, it's God's ways are not the ways of this world. So he's driven out, go away, cast away. Then Herod's story, most of you know it sort of by memory. Herod was fascinated with John the Baptist. He actually protected him oftentimes. 
It says that he couldn't really understand him, but he liked to listen to him. But he was cautious because he knew that, that John the Baptist was saying, this marriage you have isn't right, you shouldn't have that. Herodias, his wife, hated that. So she wanted to get John the Baptist, but she couldn't work through her husband. So here comes this strange and terrible party, dancing. What are you going to ask for? You could ask for half of the kingdom, the Bible says, and instead the head of John the Baptist. What's that about? It's about letting us know that faith can cost us, that faith has a price. The ways of God are not the ways of the world. Now, right there where you attempt to say, got it, got it, got it, get this. Remember this, trust this. The real gospel today, as far as the good news, comes from that letter to Ephesians. Now, when Lutherans think about Ephesians, we think chapter 2. Saved by grace, not our own doing, gift from God. But these verses in chapter 1, I'm here to tell you, go down and sneak up a folder from the traditional worship and take it home and put it on your mirror in the bathroom because they are really, really good words. Chapter 1 reminds us of this. Never does God ask us for something before he gifts us something. Remember this, trust this, believe this. The cost of our faith never comes before the promise. The cost of our faith never comes before the grace. The cost of our faith never comes before the prize and the treasure of the kingdom of God. That letter from Ephesians is just filled with such good words. Verse 4, God chose us in Jesus. Verse 5, God destined us for adoption. Verse 7, in Christ we have redemption through His blood. We have forgiveness for our sins. We have the riches of His grace. Verse 13, we are marked with the seal of the promise of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians is filled with God's promise. I mean, listen to those for three phrases. Redemption in His blood. Whatever that might mean to you, it means we're saved by God's grace. Inheritance in heaven because of that grace. Forgiveness of our sins, which holds marriages and churches and congregations and communities. And we would pray even nations together. We would pray even that together. Blameless in His sight because of God's grace. This is the gospel of the Lord, what I felt like having after she read the second lesson. This is really today the gospel, the good news. Saved by God's grace, loves us, redeems us, and then, only then comes the call to be disciples. A call that might cost us something. If we're honest, sitting in this fellowship hall, pretty likely not going to cost us our lives. But if we're honest, it probably would surprise you how many folks still in this world, it does threaten their lives. We don't give that much thought anymore. But countless places where to be a Christian, you literally are risking your life. We're glad that that's probably not the case here. But it still might cost you what I would say, your life. Because those verses that say, you live when you lose your life, you live when you live for others, those are the verses that are the heart and soul here. If your life is only about yourself, if your life is only about your own, if your life is all about what you want, that's not the life that Christ wants. Our faith requires of us to lose our life, to give up part of ourselves for the love of others, to serve the ways and the promises of Jesus, to be about Jesus. Why? Because the kingdom is still at work. There's got to be times you watch the news and think, can't be. No, the kingdom is still at work. And God wants us to be doing part of that work. He's made that clear. Not just to be watchers, not just to be listeners, not just to be once a week come and sit in the fellowship hall worshipers, but to be believers. So, the specifics of your life are so specific. The specifics of my life are different. I'm not going to throw out 15 different things that should happen. But think about it this way. If the ways of the Christ are different than the ways of the world, then... Certain jokes for people of God certain shouldn't work. Certain language for people of God shouldn't work. Certain actions can no longer be our actions. But flip that around. If someone says, oh, you do the church thing, yes, I do. Now you don't have to bowl them over. But don't be embarrassed about that because Christ is your life. 
If a friend's in difficulty, if a friend's in difficulty, even if it's awkward, you speak up or you speak out or you go running simply to help. Why? Because we have the promises of God that far outweigh any promises of this life. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, and in Luke chapter 7, verse 28, Matthew 11, 11, Luke 7, 28, the Bible tells us there is absolutely no one born of human greater than John the Baptist. Only person greater than John the Baptist is Jesus. Matthew 11, 11, Luke 7, 28, no one greater than John the Baptist. And his greatness came in witnessing, in serving, and today we know, into the point of dying for Jesus the Christ. We're not John the Baptist. We don't need to eat locusts and honey and wear camel's hair. Most likely not going to lose our heads. But every need for faithfulness is still ours. To each day, try to be faithful. Each week. This day, this week. Each day, all days. To be strong, to be faithful, to be disciples, to be people of God, to be strong, to be faithful, to be disciples, to be people of God. Because, first and foremost, God is faithful to us. Because, first and foremost, God gives us life. Because, first and foremost, we have the promise of life to come. We ought to live for Christ because Christ gives us life. So we just do our best, and God will do the rest. Amen. The song that we're going to sing, probably you haven't sung it before, or at least a few times. The tune is somewhat familiar. I choose it because as the slides will come up on the second series of slides, let righteousness roll on as others' cares we heed. An ever-flowing stream of faith translated into deed. Three verses of a song that really remind us to be faithful, to be disciples. We stand, we sing it together. Trusting in the power of God that lives in our heart, we use the words of the creeds both at home and here to confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We share the prayers together. On each of the petitions, the part that you respond with is, as always, hear our prayer. Holy God, you welcome your people into one family and gather all things to yourself. Bestow your grace upon your beloved church. Lavish your wisdom upon us and redeem us from our faults that by our witness all might praise your glory. 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our awesome creator, you steadfastly tend to the smallest of seeds and the mightiest of sycamore trees. Spring up green growth from the earth. Nourish the growth of fruit, grain, and other crops. And bless the work of farmers and laborers. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Merciful God, turn the ears of those who are in power to the voices of prophets in our own day. Protect those who speak difficult truths when it is risky to do so. Lord, in your mercy. God of strength, you are near to those who endure difficulty. Comfort all who are dealing with adversity, be that sorrow and grief, be that tragedy and heartache, be that illness and suffering, be that harshness and hurt. Pour forth your care and goodness upon us all, Lord, in your mercy. God of love, we pray for this holy house and all who worship here in person and online. We pray especially for one another, giving thanks for the fellowship we share in the work of the kingdom. Strengthen us in this upcoming week to be your people and to share the good news of your grace and love. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you, O oh God, for the promises of a purposeful life in this earthly journey and for the promise of life to come in the fullness of the kingdom. We are your children, O oh Lord, and we rejoice for the assurance of your continual presence in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayers to you, O oh God, trusting in your abiding grace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We share God's peace kind of from a distance still, but so good to have so many of you back. Peace of the Lord. God's peace be with you online, that's for sure. If you hadn't just been back, I'd have been calling you to preach this. <laughs> For all of the time that we've changed some of our worship practices, which means passing the offering plate and all of that, we continue to offer an offering prayer, which reminds us that everything we have is a gift from God, the generosity of many of you sharing your gifts with this church, and the reality that offering is really an act of worship. So join me in the prayer. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day, you shower us with blessings. As you have raised us to new life in Christ, give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need. Awaken us to the needs of others. And at the end, bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. We share our prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We thank you so much for coming. We rejoice in your presence each week. We'll add a few more chairs next week. Each week we do our best to keep each other safe. Each week we rejoice that slowly we are making our way through all of this. The God of grace is with us. The God of grace is with those of you online as well. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well done, Sarah. Well done, Sarah. No, the chairs stay, ladies and gentlemen. The chairs stay.